Folks, did you hear that? ChatGPT claims that this man is the number one Airbnb short-term rental coach in the world. Folks, the other exciting stat that you need to know about this man is his students have created over a billion dollars in revenue in short-term rental. I'd love for you to stand, show some energy, show some love for Sean Rackerty. So good to have you here. Thank you for coming to Estero Wealth. My name is Sean Rakijich. I am a YouTuber and I found my way into Airbnbs kind of by accident. I'll give you that story a little bit. Today, I want to teach you one of the most important things you can learn. Um, something that I think the whole conference cares about is revenue management. And I am going to teach you from my new book, The Revenue Manager's Handbook. But I know what some of you might be thinking. How is a YouTuber writing a book when he should be dancing doing TikTok videos, you know? Um, well, funny story is long before I started teaching or coaching Airbnb and posting on YouTube, I was working with businesses that are way more stubborn than anyone you've ever met, including Bill Faith. Newspapers. The Houston Chronicle, Dallas Morning News, Philadelphia Inquirer. Those, that have, those of you that know me, you might notice all my Airbnbs have been in cities that I was consulting for newspapers. And this was alive until COVID hit. So I'm used to coaching. And I started coaching in 2018, one-on-one, -on -one, if this thing will work. So I started coaching one-on-one. -on -one. I asked before I got on stage, my guy who runs my community, I'm like, I want to know how much coaching have I actually done? And it's 2,300 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's a lot of clock time. So a lot of what I'm about to teach you today was from me working with individuals who would show me their calendars and go, why am I not getting bookings? Why am I getting bookings three months of the year, not getting bookings three months of the year? What is going on? Why was last year so good and why does this year suck so bad? I'm not changing anything. And I'm like, that's actually the point. You didn't change anything. So I'm not just the Airbnb YouTube guy. I am one of the most experienced coaches in the world, and I don't want to get into too much exposition, so let's begin. I hope you're all taking notes, because this will be hopefully highly valuable. And I don't want to make this overly difficult, because some people are good at math and some are not, so let's take this back to second grade. Bill has 30 apples. Now, Bill had a lot more than 30 apples, but he spent a lot of apples making this happen, so Bill, thank you so much for this event. Um, I'll give you back some apples as soon as I get up off stage. He did give three of those apples to Mike. Mike said he'd pay him back. Mike and him have a good relationship. But he gave four apples to Chris. And that's not, that's not like a chide against Mike. Chris has probably just done more work to put this event on. So Chris got more apples. But now the question is, how many does he have left? But what's more than that is he's about to give away some more apples. He gives eight apples to Verbo. He gives four apples to Booking.com. But now, someone on Airbnb wants 14 apples. And they will not book unless you have all 14 apples. Can Bill get this booking? The answer is? All right, good morning, guys. Who here has a coffee in their hand? <laughs> Drink it. Let's go. So Bill cannot get this Airbnb booking because he doesn't have 14 apples in a row. We already know the answer. I'm bad at this thing. I'll learn it. No sale. Your calendar is just like this little second grade story. The dates in the future are your apples. But even more than just this concept, some apples are worth more than others, and some apples are worth nothing once they become past dates. Your goal as a short-term rental owner, manager, operator is to identify when your apples are ripe for sale and how to sell all of your apples, and that's what I'm gonna teach you to do today, is how to sell all of your apples. Who's ready? All right. Once again, thank you so much for having me. This is the most exciting situation I've ever been in my life. I, uh, I did not ever plan on being on stage like this. I was actually in a screamo band. I thought I was gonna to come to Nashville to record an album at one point, and um, this is my version of Nashville, so I'll take it. <laughs> So I'm gonna give you some terms and definitions first uh, to catch any of you guys up who may not know some of these terms, and we're gonna kind of dive into what these mean for you. So supply and demand, a lot of you already know this, right? It's the amount of, the amount of supply is how many apples you have 
from our little example. And the demand is how many people want your apples, right? And we saw post-COVID a lot of demand, right? Revenge travel, people going into places like the Poconos, Chattanooga, Tennessee, people going to suburbs. Um, but then that revenge travel kind of waned a little bit, right? But what happened is because of that boom of revenge travel, a lot of people got into the space. Who here picked up their first short-term rental within the last two years? All right, so you guys got in while it was good, and you've probably saw like um, a decrease in booking velocity in your slow seasons at least. You guys still might have enough demand to get your places booked completely in peak season, but you might have seen that the winter was just a little bit more rough than the year before. And that's supply and demand. And if you can track it, you can make the proper adjustments, and we're gonna talk about that here soon. Dynamic price is the response to supply and demand. It's that your prices will go up or they'll go down based on market forces, based on whether or not there are customers, based on whether or not people feel confident to travel, right? That was another one, is with recession fears, people started booking more last minute. We still got the same booking traffic in some of my cities, but people weren't booking in advance because they just weren't confident enough to make plans. So they're making all their plans last minute. So as you start to realize how your supply and demand is behaving in your markets, your dynamic pricing strategy will be to raise your prices, lower your prices, hold out for last minute bookings, or race to the bottom to get booked first. Adjacency is a new one for a lot of you. I've actually made this word up and I convinced Wheelhouse to put it in the software. Um, it's like an orphan day. Who here knows what an orphan day is? It's a pretty popular term, isn't it? Well, imagine that that orphan day only has a booking on one side of that booking. So somebody checks out on the 10th of the month. The 10th is the adjacent day. Even though the rest of the calendar is open, the 10th is still adjacent to the checkout on the 10th. Now, if you think about the way bookings work, if your average length of stay is, say, four days, somebody who's going to book the 10th would have to check in on the 10th, and their reservation would be for the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th. There's only one combination there. Making the 10th one of the hardest days of your calendar to book just because somebody's checking out that day. So adjacency, just by this little bit of logic, means every time you have a checkout on Monday or Tuesday, you should be dropping that Monday or Tuesday price because it shows up in search less. And conversion is really how we get our bookings. Somebody can see a listing, they look at your listing and they convert but that Monday will show up in search like four times or five times less. Another concept that isn't original to me, but it's one that's original to this industry because a lot of people got into this by way of traditional real estate is contribution margin. Who took a plane to get here? I know I did, it came from Dallas. That plane will cost the same amount of money whether or not you and I were on that plane. The pilot gets paid, the flight attendants get paid, there's a lot of gas that gets got gets guzzled on the way through. If you buy a ticket and you sit down, their incremental cost is the paper they print your ticket on and the coffee and the pretzels that they give you while you're in flight. That's their incremental cost. We're not that dramatic. Our incremental costs are housekeeping, shampoo, stuff like that. But your mortgage, your rent, your insurances, a big portion of your utilities could arguably be the same because you wanna keep that place perfectly temperatured for when somebody checks in, so you're still using electricity. So whether or not you get five days booked or 20 days booked, your costs outside of the turnover costs are fixed. So your pricing strategy should be loyal to contribution margin the same way that an airline would. Food for thought, keep that in your back pocket. Lead time is one that I hope you all are familiar with, right? The less days you have left to get booked, the less confident that you can say that you're going to get booked and your price needs to follow that. Now, this can change for some listings. We're gonna talk about this here soon. And season to season, lead time behavior changes. Lead time combined with demand can then become an equation to tell you how many views you think you're going to get. The number of views per day times the days that you have to get booked is your total views. Divide that by your conversion percentage and that's your likelihood of getting a booking. If your likelihood of getting a booking is low, what do you do with your prices? They go down. If your likelihood of getting a booking is super high, raise your prices because you've got a chance to swing for the fence. 
Revenue management is more than just dropping your prices when you're having a hard time. It's about discovering how much you can make. And I hope I'm gonna teach you guys to reach for the stars on some of your best days. Don't let them get booked at whatever the prices you have are. Pace is a way that we do this. Now, pace is really hard for a lot of you. Who here has less than three properties? Doing pace without a portfolio is tough, but I'm gonna teach you guys a hack. So when you have five or 10 properties in one area and you see someone book far into the future, like for Taylor Swift's concert or something like that, just like on the stage, if you see that, you can raise the rest of the prices for the other nine properties you have going, I don't know why somebody booked nine or 10 months in advance, but something must be up. If two people book far future within a short period of time, you can ring that bell and go, wait, there's got to be an event. Even though my pricing software has no clue what's going on, I'm going to go into my software, jack my prices up 40% or 50% until I can figure out why people are trying to book all my inventory for a specific weekend. Where the weekend before that, nobody's booking. And those, those prices stay the same. But the pace at which a specific day gets booked should govern how quickly you raise or lower those prices. Now, if you guys wanna do this and you only have one property, I did not make a slide for this because I didn't plan on giving this away for free, but it is in the book, so we're gonna talk about it. I want you all to, when you have time, go to Airbnb as a traveler, and I want you to search in your area for your property. Like, click as many buttons as you can that really pin down what type of property that you have. Then I want you to wish list every single property that you see. Those are your direct competition. When you go back and use the wish list feature on Airbnb, you can search a wish list for dates. I wonder how many properties are booked on the 15th to the 17th. I wonder how many properties are booked two months from now. It will take your wish list and sort it into two batches. This batch is booked, this batch is available. So you can spy on all of your competition through a wish list and identify weekends where everyone's booked or identify times where no one's booked. It's a really cool hack. There are more terms and definitions because these are a little bit higher level. Um, and I just pulled script right from the book. You can read it off the screen. I'm gonna give you guys the general concepts of them. What I call a zero day or your red line is the last day that you want to get a booking. Who here has had a party at their Airbnb? Sucks, right? Um, they'll trash the place. You have to cancel the next guest. Airbnb will delist you because you had a party and it was their fault in the first place. You know, stuff like that. Not cool. So your red line is the last day that you are comfortable getting a booking because you don't want to get a booking two or three days out. So all of your pricing strategy should be adjusted for what you consider to be your zero day. A four bedroom house could be eight, 12, 15 days in advance. That might be where you're comfortable. A studio apartment, downtown Dallas, Austin, Houston, our zero day is today. If we don't have a booking today, we're cool with it. Because we get monthly bookings where somebody comes into town and wants a monthly stay and they, they check in that day. Or people end up deciding that they wanna to come to Dallas last minute, they book last minute. Studios have a different zero day than a four bedroom house. Every property has what I would call a golden window. Um, a golden window is the perfect range of days that make the most money. So for example, your property on Verbo could get a booking nine months in advance, and that person will pay a ton of money on Verbo. But a person on Airbnb will book three months in advance, and they'll pay the same amount. But you stop getting bookings on Verbo for that price. Your price on Verbo would have to come down, but on Airbnb, it holds just fine. But then two months, three months, or two months, one month, two weeks in advance, all of your prices have to start coming down because you're running out of time. And on Airbnb, no one is gonna book nine months in advance for that full price. So the concept of a golden window is like a bell curve shape. Your calendar has these target dates where if you could get your bookings in that specific range, those are your highest ADR bookings. And channel to channel, they'll change. I don't know much about Marriott Homes and Villas, but I, I assume that they perform kind of like Verbo does. So you're gonna have a bell curve for Verbo, bell curve for booking, bell curve for Airbnb, and they're gonna be different ranges. But identifying, you can actually go back into your transaction history and look at your highest ADR bookings, and then also look at how far those people booked in advance. 
It's a little bit of math that you do on your own, but if any of you have done bookings for a couple years, you can go back and find out my best paying bookings, how long in advance are they booking for? And you start to run your pricing strategy around this optimal window of time. Who here is still with me? Good, all right. I wanna make sure that this stuff isn't just, I, I do this on YouTube too, I just like throw data at you guys, like do this and then do this. So it is early, I know you guys are waking up. So next one is called the hit rate. The hit rate is how successful your pricing strategy is. So imagine you've got your golden window and you try to get some bookings and you make your place like $100,000 a night, right? You're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a million bucks this month, nail it. And you don't get any bookings. Your hit rate is 0%. Right? But let's say you price it like $350 a night, you're not gonna make a million, but you get like 80% of your occupancy in that one window of time. That hit rate is 80%. I will tell you, any, any one like section of your calendar, you don't want 100% of your bookings to come in. You want to distribute that through a, like a, a spaced out period of time where you've got kind of healthy bookings throughout the whole like lead time calendar. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like here in a second. Your hit rate is how successful your prices are to get bookings in whatever window those prices are. So for example, you might have your prices at $500 a night six months in advance, $400 a night four months in advance, $200 a night one month in advance. And all three of those prices would have a hit rate before you change your prices. A risk-adjusted rack rate, I know I'm hitting you guys with a lot of stuff, so hopefully you could, your pen can keep up. This is basically the concept of your lowest price, but modified for risk. Again, those of you who had parties, you've noticed it's not just last minute bookings, but it's last minute cheap bookings that tend to get parties. In Philadelphia, before we shut down, I shut down Philadelphia for some gang activity, it was really sad, but we noticed that our portfolio would get exposed to like very bad activity if any of our listings were under $100 a night, even our small studio apartments. So our cheapest properties, we still couldn't put below 100 a night because we would immediately have a problem. And that's just what we had to do with Philadelphia. That's an example of a risk-adjusted rack rate. You could get booked at lower, but now the risk of damage is too great that getting that booking is no longer worth it. So sometimes we have to go empty. Now back to that concept of hit rate. The opposite side of your hit rate is what I call your lowest documented attempt. And hopefully this is where I'm gonna to start to really paint a picture for you guys. Let's say you do try to charge a thousand bucks a night and you get a lot of bookings and then you drop your rate to 800 bucks and then you drop your rate to six and drop your rate to four. Well, let's say you do that on a schedule. You always drop your rate from a thousand down to 800 at the three month mark. Well, that thousand dollars is still your lowest documented attempt if you have days that did not get booked at a thousand. And you guys can keep this at a journal. Be like, at 60 days into the future, what is my lowest price? What is my lowest price that did not get booked? At 10 days into the future, what's my lowest price that did not get booked? Because I think a lot of you have been here, right? You've got, a, you've got a price for a month out, and then you don't get a booking. Then you change your price again, maybe 10 days out, you don't get a booking. And now you're staring at this calendar where tomorrow, the next day, the next day is empty, and you're like, why the hell is my listing at $80 a night and it's still not booked, right? If any of you have ever been somewhere like that, what you need to go back and look at was what was the lowest price I was trying to charge all the way down to 80 and when was I changing it? And this is where zones come into play. This is brand new, new stuff. This is not even on my YouTube channel until about 20 minutes from now. I'm actually... Put, like I'm publishing a video as I'm on stage so you guys can go back and get more of this if this is of interest to you. Zones are this concept of breaking your lead time up into something that's not so scary anymore. A lot of people look at lead time like this big forest, like I don't know when to change my prices. I know that lead time matters, but I don't know what my prices should be. If you guys take a little calendar, like one of those annual calendars that you put on your desk, and just take some like markers and start drawing boxes, you could do something like this. For this example, we would call zone one everything in the blue outline. This is for like a, like a smaller property, like a studio apartment. A studio apartment, anything more than 45 days in advance is far or far future. But zone five, the very last one, is only three days, right? Our last minute, our zone five, is three days into the future. That's when we are trying like, trying like hell to get a booking. 
Everything in between that, zones two, three, and four, those could be at any point in time our golden window, season to season. So in this case, I colored what I consider to be the golden window in green, which is zone two. Zone two is when we'd like to get all of our bookings. It's when we get the best price for this studio apartment. A lot of you have houses though, right? Who here has houses and not small properties? Okay, I didn't leave you behind, I promise. This is more what a zone would look like for a house. More than four months into advance, we're looking at zone one. That's where like, if you don't get a booking in this zone, it's not the end of the world, depending on where you are. Some places like the Poconos or um, like destination properties like Fort Lauderdale, zone one will be where you get all your fat bookings. But like for an urban property, something just outside of Dallas or something just outside of Chicago, this is probably more appropriate. Zone two, that yellow area, is not the golden window in this example, but it's start where you're trying to start get some bookings. And then zone three here is your golden window. Now zone four and zone five, you're gonna notice, aren't the last two boxes. I've got this black box now. That is my red line. We do not want bookings to come in inside of that black box. We want 100% occupancy inside that black box. That's what we want. So this is an example of how you guys might draw your own zones out. Now what you can do with this is you can look at where your bookings are coming from and see if you've got like a, like a bias in your calendar. If you're zone one heavy, that means that you have this low flat price typically. Have you guys ever seen an Airbnb property that was beautiful but their prices are the same every day of the year? Like we're talking old school host. Somebody listed on, their, their, on Airbnb like 2013 and they haven't changed anything since, right? Their property is like 175 bucks a night, every night, weekends and weekdays, all year round. Those types of properties, when they are low priced, will be zone one heavy, far future heavy. People are just booking in advance. And you know what a lot of Airbnb hosts, they don't change their prices because this is working for them. They have no clue that they have an opportunity for more money. But this is a business, guys. If you have the opportunity to make 20 or 30% more on your property, you should be trying to find out how to do that. Okay, zone three heavy would be someone who has a healthy flat price, like a typical like weekdays, weekends pricing strategy. Their prices will fluctuate a little bit. Um, they're not cheap enough for zone one, but they also don't ever change their prices to get bookings in zone five. So these people will be the ones that typically like float between 50 and 80% occupancy, but that is season to season. They'll be 80%, 85% occupied in peak, and they're 50% or less in slow season. And who here has had a month where their calendar was less than 50% occupied? That sucks, doesn't it, right? Even if it is slow season, like that sucks. Like this is an income property. You could work to make this thing make money. And a lot of people have co-hosts that are zone three heavy. They don't really think that prices need to swing as far as they could. And zone five, are like the overambitious pricing people who throw their prices into the moon, don't ever change their prices, and they get tunnel vision as another side effect. Um, who here has got a lot of last minute bookings? They're very active in their calendar, they, get, they scrap for them, right? Those of you who are very good at getting last minute bookings tend to suffer in this type of situation where you don't get enough far future bookings because you only see your calendar like this. The 21 days into the future on your multi-calendar. You guys forget that you can scroll to the right and you can see like months to come. A lot of people don't. They don't price anything else from that on load. And that's why some people are so zone five heavy is their prices are all wrong. Absolutely just trash until inside of this window they go, wait, this listing doesn't have any bookings, let's change the price, right? So if you go back into your transaction history, you'll notice I don't have any bookings 45 days in advance. I only get my bookings 10, 15 days out. Zone five is a terrible place to be stuck in because you make no margin on zone five bookings. So one thing that you guys can use that I love to use in order to adjust your prices through Airbnb, because what I want you guys to do is I want you not to abandon what you were already doing. The quickest way to screw up a pricing strategy is to try to recreate it from scratch. You guys can build based on what's working for you now. Who here uses a pricing software? I bet a lot of you, right? And they're great, but who here has a pricing software and still has listings that go 50% empty in slow season? 
Yeah, pricing softwares aren't the Wizard of Oz. They're not magic, are they? They're not gonna solve all your problems. My rule for pricing software is if inside of three weeks I don't have a booking, the software screwed up. They made a mistake. I should have all my calendar booked three weeks out if my pricing software is correct. So what I'll do is instead of going into my pricing software and making adjustments, I'll go back to my multi-calendar and I will start applying rule sets to make adjustments to my multi-calendar on Airbnb because your pricing software manages your Verbo, manages your direct bookings, manages your booking.com. And Airbnb is a great place to try to drive to get last minute bookings, but you might also find that you'll get last minute direct bookings and you don't wanna compromise the prices for your direct bookings. So rule sets are something that you can apply just on Airbnb. It's like the final stop. The way that this works is when you create your listing, you set all your settings. You pick your amenities, all your good stuff. Then your software makes adjustments. Price Labs or Wheelhouse will adjust your prices, minimum length of stay, stuff like that, even at a monthly discount. And that's where most of us are, right? We created our listing, we docked in a software, and it's just cruising. Rule sets override everything that you've created if they conflict with what you've created. So for example, let's say your rule set had a 20% monthly discount and a two-night minimum. In this case, we can go and change that to make it a one night minimum. We can keep the monthly discount at 20%, but we can add a 10% off last minute discount, or we can add a 10% off three day discount with a rule set. And they only apply to the days that you adjust them for. So if you've got a calendar that's completely open and you just decide to have Friday, Saturday have a special like promotion, you can just do it on your Fridays and Saturdays. The rest of your week, doesn't get the 10% last minute discount, only the weekends. And they color these. Now this is gonna be a little bit tough to see. I hope you can see some colors on there. Um, but for example, there's gonna be an adjacency rule set that we create. Um, you see at the, the bottom two rows, I've got some bookings off of Airbnb. That's why they're grayed out with that little dot. So for the checkout on this day, that says 156, I added a rule set that says, if someone stays for two days, I'm gonna give them 30% off of this one day. I'd like to not get a one day stay, personally. I'm going to allow it on this day at 156, but if somebody books this day and the next day, they'll get $50 off, roughly $50 off, that one day. So the 156 plus 156, and then one day gets 50 bucks off, so now they're paying about 250 bucks. That's how an adjacency rule set can work. You guys have to make these from your multi-calendar on Airbnb. And I'm gonna show you a couple more, all right? So adjacency rule set, 30% off or 20% off for two day stay. That's an adjacency rule set. The final price rule set. This is an important one. If you go and override and just drive to the bottom to try to get a booking, like your absolute lowest rack rate price, and you have a monthly discount or a weekly discount, or you have a four day discount in Airbnb, you could charge like as low as $100 a night and then somebody could book for a month and you give them 35% off. They got $65 a night for that one day and you don't want that to happen. So you can go in and make a rule set on Airbnb that says no discounts for every single imaginable scenario and then make it a one night minimum. That's what my no discounts like final price rule set is. So when I drop prices to something that is my final price, there's no gimmicks, there's no strategy involved, I just wanna know we're gonna collect 79 bucks. That's a final price rule set. It's one of my most used rule sets because in my pricing strategy, I overprice my listings and then I'll chisel to the right price with length of stay, well, length of stay discounts. So for example, in slow season, I will lower my prices for a monthly or an eight week long stay really dramatically and I'll do that far in advance. But for like peak season, I don't want any discounts on peak season anyway. People are gonna pay full price for your listing. They'll pay full price for a three-day stay, they'll pay a three-day price, they'll pay a full price for five. You don't want a monthly booking in peak season. Like to give a monthly discount, give somebody a really good rate, that's where all of your profit goes. So we will adjust that. In peak season, we'll not use discounts until the weekends are gone, and then we'll start to apply discounts, for example. But at one point, we have to drive our price to the bottom, we use this final price rule set. There's a fun one called a weekend bundle. Have you ever seen like on a, on a website where they try to get you to buy something else when all you wanted was a couple days? You know Airbnb does that? 
Airbnb has this thing that says add on Thursday and only pay $60 more. It happens all the time. So what you can do is you can have your weekends at a high price. You can even raise them up because let's say, who, who here actually has this happen? Your weekends get booked and your weekdays don't. We've all been there. I know you guys have had properties like that. The way that you can prevent this is far in advance before you ever get any bookings, raise your weekend prices up and then make what I call a weekend bundle rule set. You apply it only to Fridays and Saturdays, so they're the only days that'll ever get a discount, but you make that discount conditional that they book for four days. So your weekends are 20 or 25% higher in price, but if somebody books for four days, they come back down to earth a little bit, forcing them to book Wednesday, Thursday, or Thursday, Sunday, or Sunday, Monday. This is a great way to make sure that you get some weekdays booked with your weekends. If you guys do this, a lot of you will notice your, like your occupancy will increase 15 to 20% in those seasons where all you get are weekends. Because there are customers that would book your place if you're priced right for a four day. But the problem is, is you're also priced right for a two day. And so the people who, there's actually more people searching for two day stays and they'll get to your listing first. And that's the problem, is if your listing gets booked by a two day because you're attractive, the four day will never find you. So this, this bundle will allow you to be less attractive to a two-day stay and allow that four-day person to come in and book it. But you, can, you might find, this is really what's fun, you raised your prices 25% on the weekends and you still get a two-day booking. And now you just made 25% more money, which is really cool. A lot of my students will do this and they're like, I had no clue I could charge so much on my weekends. I had no idea. And so I've had students with houses that were priced at like $200 on weekdays and $350 on weekends. They are now charging $800 on weekends and they're getting booked with, without a four day stay. They're paying $800 a night. They would have existed as a host their whole life charging like $350 a night. That's all they thought they could get. So using a weekend bundle like this gives you multiple scenarios where you could get booked at a really high price or booked at a moderate price. And this leads to what I call price discovery. How much can I get booked for? And more is always better, right? More is better? Okay, cool. I wanna make sure you guys are awake. I only had had a little bit of coffee before I got on stage, so I'm kinda of right there with you. It's kinda of early. There is what I call a modified seasons rule set. This one allows you to, on weekdays usually, for peak season, remove your discounts. You can make a rule set just for like your peak season, you know, June, July, August, say no discounts. Slow season, you can make a modification where you have really aggressive discounts. And then last minute, you can lower your price and have less discounts. So for an example, you have a 30% monthly stay, and that's your normal like monthly discount. And you've got a 15% week-long discount. But inside of five days, your price is really low and you wanna protect that, but you still wanna give a little bit of a monthly discount. You can drop the price of your listing and change the monthly discount to 10%, something that a rule set can do. So, in summary, rule sets allow you to accomplish things that your pricing software won't allow you to do on Airbnb. Because if you guys noticed, I'm talking about three-day discounts and four-day discounts, but Verbo doesn't have that. Booking.com doesn't have that. Marriott Homes and Villas don't have that. I'm sure that your direct booking software doesn't have that coded in. Unless you guys paid a ton of money for your direct booking software, you probably don't have a four-day discount anywhere but on Airbnb. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to run a pricing strategy that allows you to get one customer who'll pay 1,000 a night just for th Saturday, Sunday, another customer that will pay 800 a night for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and find another customer that'll pay 500 a night for the whole month. All three customers exist, and by using rule sets, you can find all three of them making a much wider, much more robust pricing strategy. And this is how you stay booked in slow season. You stop trying to find one customer and you start casting a net for all of them. You with me on that? Get me? Good. So, some ground rules for you all. I'm actually doing great on time, this is nuts. This is so good, exciting. Be the first booked in slow season. If your like, neighborhood or city has below 50% occupancy, you wanna be the first booked. Because everyone here knows that, just that disgusting feeling in your gut where your whole calendar is open in slow season and you're just like, there's no customers. 
There's nothing I can do. I'm too late. I can't get a booking no matter what. And so if you want to make sure that you get a booking before your competitors wake up to the fact that they have to drop their prices while they're still sleeping on this five months in advance, I want you guys to put in like a six week or eight week discount with a rule set. Just, we call this de-risking. Um, I've got, I've, I've peaked at over 155 properties. We're still over 100 properties now. But what we try to do in slow season is we try to make sure that 50% of all of our properties have monthly stays, the worst month of the year. That's removing that exposure. Because if we have 100 and something properties where we have to scrap for bookings, they're, they're competing with each other in slow season, right? If I've got 30 units in the same apartment complex, they're competing with each other for bookings. So if I can get 20 of those units booked for multi-month stays into slow season, I only have 10 listings that have to fight for the same last minute bookings. Be the first booked in slow season before your competition realizes that they've made a mistake. Now be the last booked in peak season. If you guys have an, uh, like a market that has over 88, 90% average occupancy, which you guys can see the data like on AirDNA or other places, you can get that data for free. If you guys have a high occupancy season, the way that this works, people book everything. Like imagine the Super Bowl. Everything's booked. You're trying to find a place. And that Red Roof Inn that has four reviews for bed bugs is $600 a night. And it's the only thing you can book. And you're like, I'm gonna bring like a fire retardant suit and sleep in like, in a, in like a space duffel bag so I don't get bed bugs. That is how peak season works. And it can work for you the same way. People will book for you if you're a valid price far in the future. But you wanna know how much you can get, so hold out. Raise your prices 30% more than your competition and let everyone else get booked. At one point, there's gonna be this bottleneck. The only properties available are you and the bed bug, bed bug city guy, and that's it. So then when somebody's like, do I pay 1,200 a night for this guy or 500 a night for this guy, you win. Be the last booked. Force people to pay your price in peak season by recognizing high demand months or high demand weeks. There's a really cool thing that you guys can do, and I can't believe I didn't notice this sooner, but this came after the whole Airbnb, like Taylor Swift host fiasco. Did you guys read about that online? A woman tried to triple the price on a customer after she booked for a Taylor Swift event. What happened to this lady is she had her prices set as she always does, and a big Swifty one year in advance booked as soon as she found out when Taylor Swift next concert was and the host didn't have time to adjust their calendar. If you guys are in an event market, okay, so not like a verbo heavy market, but an event market, don't make your calendar available for more than nine months in advance. You might even do six. Stay plugged into your pricing software. Price Labs and Wheelhouse and beyond, they'll all track everyone else's bookings for the six months that you're closed, and when you open back up, your prices will be listed at that peak season price. But if you have a pricing software that's highly, revent, on, highly dependent on tracking events, block your calendar more than six months out. That way you don't get caught in that same Taylor Swift situation. Um, like I said before, never price for one customer. You can have a rate Friday, Saturday. You can have a rate for the week. You can have a rate for the month. Um, they will change season to season. Um, it, another one is never give a discount when full price will do. And that's a big peak season thing. A lot of you guys have discounts baked into your listing. And if you get booked in a regular seasonal, like regular month of the year, you should know that your peak season would be more. And that should be a red flag for you. I'm running the same pricing strategy eight months of the year, and I'm only dropping my prices for slow season. And you're getting healthy bookings eight months of the year. That means there's two or three months that you can raise your prices. But a lot of us are too comfortable with what we have, and we only scramble when we don't have enough of something else. And even if you did nothing to make your slow seasons better, if you can increase your revenue by 30% in peak season, you can take that 30% and store it away for slow season, even if there's nothing else that you can do, okay? As far as hit rate goes, lowest documented attempt, all the stuff that I talked about earlier, it is better to get a booking and know that you got that booking at a certain price and have that data than to not get booked at all. It's like a game of battleship. The moment you get a booking one day, you can assume that your next weekend could get the same, or the next weekend could get a little bit more. And you can build your pricing strategy from the days that get booked. So if your pricing strategy is all screwed up, then yeah, for the next 45 days, just drop all of your prices, and as soon as you get a booking, 
for all the days after it, slowly start to raise your rates. It's almost like you're casting that fishing net, right? Low prices for the next 45 days, and whatever day gets booked, you use that as your anchor price, and you slowly raise your prices into the future from there. And that's how you can build from the ground up. I've had a lot of students that have so crushed by their slow seasons before they come to me as a coach, and their prices are so wonky because they followed this guy's tip, they've got that software, they're doing this other thing, and we just have to go, let's start from scratch. Let's build from the bottom, let's fill your calendar this week or next week, and let's slowly create a calendar that works. Price discovery from the ground up. If you have no bookings, it's the best thing that you can do, honestly. Now, who here thought some of this was interesting and new? Cool. Thank you. I've got a confession. This is level two of five of nerdiness for me. So <laughs> this is one step above my free content. Um, like, I, like they said, I'm the biggest YouTuber in the world on this. This is my very first book, but I've done a bunch of webinars on everything from the Airbnb algorithm, pricing classes, and then above that, I've got different like, courses and mentorships and communities. So there's a long way to go to be the best revenue manager in the world, is what I'm trying to say. There's a lot to this. If you guys found any of this valuable, I want you to not stop here. I want you to keep learning. I want you to study your competition, make that wish list of your competition. I want you to find your unbooked days as interesting instead of as threatening. Like, that's interesting that this, this, this didn't get booked. That's interesting. It sucks, but it's interesting, right? This book is not available yet. It'll be released in the summer, but if you hopefully Google search the Revenue Manager's Handbook, it should show up. But also, like I said, I just published a YouTube video. So if you go to YouTube and type in Airbnb, look for the beard, you're gonna find me. So thank you very much, guys. I've got two minutes left, but I think that's all I've got for you. I do have one request, though.